Coming up, a Native leader is calling on Pope Francis to apologize to Indigenous people in the U.S. Plus, sacred land to the Amamutsun is under threat of being destroyed. And we're taking a look at a new film about Oklahoma boarding schools. I am Aliyah Chavez. Join us for those interviews plus headlines from the ICT Newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. Arizona PBS is proud to support Indian Country Today. For six decades, we've provided television programs and now digital content. But we go beyond that, sending outreach teams across Arizona, offering workshops in language and literacy, family engagement and community outreach, and supporting tribal communities with early learning and school readiness resources. Join us at azpbs.org. This is the ICT Newscast with Aliyah Chavez. Kuwati Hopa. Thank you for joining us. There are new developments in Interior Secretary Deb Holland's effort to remove the S word from federal lands. Earlier this week, the agency announced that its task force has finished its review into more than 600 geographic features that have the S word in it. These kinds of features include names of streams, summits, valleys, lakes, and others. The five letter S word is largely considered an offensive and racist term, particularly for Indigenous women. The task force received more than 6,000 comments from the public and 300 from tribal nations. This week, it officially gave recommendations to the U.S. Board on Geographic Names, and that office is expected to vote on which recommendations to accept in September. After that, a final list will be published. In California, a tribal nation has made a major donation to a prominent law school. This week, the Federated Indians of Great and Rancheria donated more than $4 million to the law school at UCLA. The donation is creating two new faculty chairs who specialize in federal Indian law. It will also add to the university's Native Nations Law and Policy Center. The tribe has already made a significant donation to UCLA law. In 2020, it donated $15 million dollars. That marked what's believed to be the largest ever contribution from a tribe to a law school. Great and Rancheria Chairman Greg Saris said in a statement that the donation reflects his tribe's commitment to defending the legal rights of Native nations. The Great and Rancheria is made up of Coast Miwok and Southern Pomo people, and its tribal lands are located in Sonoma County, California. Last week in Canada, the one-year countdown to the opening ceremony of the 2023 North American Indigenous Games was launched. It will be one of the largest sporting events held in the Atlantic region. APTN's Angel Moore has the story. Mi'kmaq traditional dancing and music helped kick off the countdown, when one year from now, Halifax will host 5,000 Indigenous athletes. Fiona Kirkpatrick Parsons is chair of the 2023 North American Indigenous Games Host Society. She can't wait for them to begin. We are so excited. One year is going to fly by and we cannot wait to host almost 5,300 beautiful Indigenous youth from all across Turtle Island right here in Chibuktuk. NAG was originally supposed to happen last year, but the COVID pandemic delayed them. Kirkpatrick Parsons has prepared if another wave hits. We have no, um, no thoughts that it's going to be postponed again. Uh, we are definitely all systems go. We don't anticipate it'll be uh, postponed, but if in the event it had to be, we would deal with it at the time and we would regroup and we would keep going because it's going to be happening in Chapuktuk no matter what. 16 sporting events will be played at 21 venues across Halifax and the Millbrook First Nation. Supporting partners committed over $1 million. One of them is the Atlantic First Nations Indigenous Water Authority. Carl Yates is interim CEO and says youth is the future. We're trying to build capacity within First Nations, so why not try to make connection with young adults who are striving for excellence? So we're hoping we can connect with them and they can connect with us. So that's why we're here. 
The games will be held over eight days and will showcase Mi'kmaq culture and build community connections. These games are life-changing for Indigenous youth. You know, the youth compete very hard to get to the games. And you know, when they come, they meet friends from all across Turtle Island. Over the next year, 3,000 volunteers will be recruited. And the athletes who will make the teams will be chosen after tryouts this summer. Angel Moore, APTN National News, Jabuktuk, known as Halifax. Well, Indigenous nations are opening film studios to attract movie and TV productions to tribal lands. The Cherokee Nation and Tusuki Pueblo are drawing attention from award-winning directors and on-site studios. In Oklahoma, the Cherokee have created a virtual sound stage. It is the first of its kind in the state and believed to be the first in a tribal territory. Cheyenne and Arapaho filmmaker Chris Ayer says everyone fell in love with the fact that they were able to shoot on tribal lands. The first film made a at the Cherokee Studio debuted at the Tribeca Film Festival in New York City last month. In New Mexico, Tasuki Pueblo built a movie studio in an existing building that was once a casino. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. Coming up, a new film on Oklahoma boarding schools and a tribe is fighting to protect its sacred land. And later, we're joined by NCAI President Vaughn Sharp. We'll be right back. Juris stock is described as the heart of Ama Mutsun culture. It is a sacred place to the tribal nation located near the Bay Area in California, and now it's under threat of being destroyed to build an open pit sand and gravel mine. Joining us today is Ama Mutsun Chairman Valentin, Valentin Lopez. Hi, Chairman. Thank you for being here. Good morning. Thank you very much. So set the scene for our viewers who are likely learning about this for the first time. Tell us about Juris stock. Well, your stock is, uh, as you uh, is at the very tail end of the Santa Cruz Mountains, and your stock um, has been, you know, is, is the most sacred site of our tribe. It is where your your stock translates to the place of the big head, and it is this is the location where our big head ceremonies were held, and um, and our ceremonies were attended by tribes as far away as Yosemite. They would come north from the Shumas tribes. They would come south from the Pomo tribes um, to attend the ceremonies here. And um, this, this occurred for, th for thousands of years. Yurostok is also the home of our spiritual leader, Kuksui. And, um, and, and it was Kuksui that would offer the, the big head dances or big head ceremonies. We also had four villages um, in or very near Eurostock, and their responsibility was to ensure that these grounds stayed sacred and were ready for ceremony and they you know and, and um, stayed um, and were prepared for ceremonies at all times. You know, so so this is an, an important intersection of, of many uh, that many tribes would pass through. And this place is actually under threat of being destroyed. Tell us about this mine, and you know who's planning this this uh, this open pit mine. The the, the sand mining is being um, proposed by a developer. They're they're called Debt Acquisition Corporation of America. What they do is they acquire um, lands that are in, you know in bankruptcy or under great strain financially. And they acquire them and they look to monetize those lands and then flip them as quick as they can. They're not planning on developing the mine or running the mine. They just want to get that permit because then they could sell the land with the permit for three or four times what they bought that property for. That's their business model here. But again, this is a sacred site. And unfortunately, the laws of Santa Clara County, the regulations rather, allow this mining permit to be approved. And there's no respect or consideration for tribal culture, cultural concerns, or spiritual concerns. And uh, we were, we've been told that the only thing that will stop this mining permit from being approved is overwhelming public support. And so since that, that you know, since we've learned that, and that was about 2016, we've been fighting hard to try and gain public support um, uh, throughout the, the greater Bay Area but also through many other tribes and other countries as well. And uh, we feel we've done a good job of that, but that our, our struggle and efforts continue. 
Can you provide some context for us about how tribal consultation has been done in this situation and what that's looked like for you? Well, there's two, two laws that allow for consultation. One is um, Senate Bill 18. Senate Bill 18 allows us to consult on general plans um, to, so we can proactively identify um, the sacred and cultural sites that are important to our tribe. So the developers will have this information. The county has yet to, the, the, the county's general plan was last updated in, in 1994, I believe it was. And since that time, it has not been updated. So we've had no opportunity to do tribal consultation under Senate Bill 18. AB 52, Assembly Bill 52, allows consultations prior to the draft environmental impact report being released on um, on, on project proposals for county for comments from the public. And so we met with the county and we requested that an ethnographic study be completed for Eurostock to show the important relationships and history of Eurostock. And that, re, that, that ethnographic was, was completed. And it showed that, that uh, you know, unequivocally that there, our history ties to this area in the way that we talk about it. Um, the, the, Anthropologists and anthropologists started talking about this in the 1880s about how important Eurostock was to the Ama Mutsen. And throughout time, this area has been referred to. And our last traditional leader was Ascension Solorizano. She passed away in 1930, but she left a lot of information on Eurostock with the Smithsonian Institute. And so that ethnographic study provides a lot of a lot of details and a lot of information on the significance of, it, of, of Eurostock. And as a result, um, the draft EIR, which was released this past Friday, um, recognizes Eurostock as a significant and unmitigatable location for any development. However, that doesn't mean the county is not going to approve it. The, the owner is still insisting that, you know, it's still, it's still going forward with the plans to put the mining operations here. They'll make money for the county. So there's a lot of pressure um, for that reason. Well, Chairman, we'll continue to follow this story. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Earlier this week, thousands of Indigenous people in Canada gathered to hear a historic apology from the leader of the Catholic Church. Shortly after, in the U.S., the president of the National Congress of American Indians, Fawn Sharp, published an open letter to Pope Francis. She joins us today to outline the message that she has for him. President Sharp, welcome back. <laughs> Good morning. Oh, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation. So as I mentioned, you wrote this open letter to Pope Francis. What exactly are you calling for? I'm calling for Pope Francis to take an acknowledgement and recognition of uh, the boarding school crisis, mass murder of our children here in the United States. Uh, if, you, if you look at what uh, happened in Canada, much of their uh, structure was modeled after the boarding school experience that we have here in the United States. And and uh, we, we have so much healing to do in this country. So he really needs to make amends uh, with, with our citizens. And that's important because Pope Francis made it very clear that his apology was specifically to Indigenous people in Canada. Did that at all surprise you? It did. I, I was hoping for a, a statement, a broad message of healing and a broad message about the, the decisions and the impact the Catholic Church had on all indigenous peoples of, of North America, but to narrowly uh, define it to Canadian uh, First Peoples, that was, uh, that was shocking and uh, disappointing. One of the parts of your letter actually spoke about the many indigenous people, not just Native Americans, American Indians, but like Alaska Natives and Native Hawaiians. Maybe talk about that. Yes, absolutely. During some of my advocacy this last year, I, I learned about all the boarding schools in, in Hawaii and as well as in Alaska. And, and when we think of the boarding schools, we, we think of it here uh, in the lower 48 and in, in North America. But to know that that experience, that horrific experience was also practiced on, on the islands of Hawaii and in Alaska. And people need to understand the broad reach of the implications of the, the Catholic Church and, and what they did to our children. 
President Sharp, you're incredibly well-connected in Indian country, and we've seen so many reactions from the Pope's apology in Canada. What have you been hearing specifically from tribal leaders in the United States? I've been hearing that he really needs to address the underlying uh, foundation of, of the Catholic Church's um, boarding school experience. When you think about what what really led the Catholic Church foundationally is, is the doctrine of discovery and the idea that uh, you know through discovery and conquest uh, that opened the door for colonization. And, and there's some so you can apologize for an act or an act of violence or murder. But to really make amends and, and reconcile, the, the church needs to address that core foundation that led to its, its mission of, of colonization and the impacts that continue to this day. You wrote your letter on Monday, and it's Thursday. Um, have you heard a, a response at all? Uh, no, I have not uh, received a response. I, I was hopeful and optimistic we might have some outreach, uh, but uh, crickets. What really strikes me, of course, is that in the United States, the Interior Department is formally investigating boarding schools as well. Do you think that that all tangles the the situation in terms of if the Pope might want to apologize, given that there is a federal investigation going on? Or can you maybe talk about, you know, how that plays into this? Yes, I, I think it would lend to uh, ensuring that every single act of violence, every single murder, uh, no stone should be left unturned. And so, we're calling on the, the Pope's leadership to help elevate that. And, and certainly the authority that the Pope has in the Catholic Church to open up all the records. Uh, right now, the investigation is impeded because we don't have full access to all the records. And, and for the Pope to step in, make the statements, and answer the call to action that we laid out in the NCI letter, that's only going to help the investigation. And, and it's my belief that that'll uh, continue to, to grow and elevate the message so that we can have a national conversation of, of truth, reconciliation, and healing. I want to switch gears and talk about what's been on your heart. It's an incredibly hard week to have to go through this and listen to the stories, um, and especially for so many of us Indigenous people who have really close connections. Maybe talk about what you've been experiencing. Yes, it, it has been a, a very hard week. Uh, we've lost some significant elders and giants within Indian country. Uh, I'm going to be attending a funeral Saturday of uh, Terry Williams, an elder who is a climate change champion. And it just seems at a time when we are really needing uh, to come together for healing, we're, we're losing significant people in Indian country. And, and that's bringing us together in prayer. And so I'm hopeful, I'm optimistic, I, I'm find, finding comfort in, in knowing that all across Indian country, we're feeling this pain. All across Indian country, we're feeling sorrow. But it's, it's, it's a reminder that we have each other and uh, the things that we need to address together, we're, we're going to be stronger for it because we're committed to prayer and because we're committed to each other and upholding each other in a time of need. President Sharp, we only have a short time left here, but we're about halfway through the year. Boarding schools is just one topic that you've planned to address. Missing and murdered Indigenous people is another topic. What are you hoping to accomplish before the year ends? I, I am going to be uh, addressing at our annual convention uh, international trade. Um, last year, we were able to uh, get a seat at the table at COP26. Uh, two weeks ago, I received an invitation to address the global business community at the WTO's uh, largest public outreach annually. It's it's the uh, public forum. It's going to be at the end of September. Uh, following that, we're going to be organizing uh, different engagements with the global business community that's very interested in uh, tapping into Indigenous nations to uh, provide support for uh, the global supply chain, uh, public-private financing. The scale of the climate crisis demands that we have public-private partnerships. And, and there's a world of opportunity from both other countries and, and the global business community that wants to assist those of us who are on the front lines of climate change. And so I'm going to be really focused on, on that as well as I've been meeting with uh, Elizabeth Warren, Senator Warren, on implementing the Broken Promises Report. Uh, we're working on legislation that will be released this fall. And so my message to her was to the extent the United States Congress chooses not to fulfill its trust responsibility, they need to support our vision for economic recovery and, and closing that economic gap. 
And so we're going to be prepared to offer a number of solutions, tax policies, economic policies, international trade and commerce. And so that's what I'm really focused on is, is the full spectrum of tribal sovereignty, uh, political standing with FPIC in that bill, economic sovereignty. And of course, we're getting ready for COP27. This year's climate negotiations are going to be convened in, in Egypt. It'll be the first time an uh, uh, international climate uh, session was going to be held in Africa. So a lot happening in the next really 60 days. And of course, climate change being so important to us all. NCA President Fawn Sharp, thank you so much. Thank you. Jeff Palmer is a professor, director, and filmmaker. He wrapped up filming last Wednesday for a new short film called Ghosts. It tells the story of three Kiowa boys who ran away from a boarding school in Anadarko, Anadarko Oklahoma, in 1891. He joins us now to break down his project. Welcome, Jeff. Hi, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you. I mean, at a high level, tell us about your film and the story that it tells. This story um, was essentially told to me by my father um, and he was told that story by his grandfather so it's an oral tradition that has been passed down I think to many um, Kiowa youth um, of these three boys who escaped a boarding school in Anadarko Oklahoma it was called the Anadarko Mission School um, in 1891 and incidentally it was it was only about probably 10 days after Wounded Knee um happened and so i i think one of the things that we tried to employ in this is um the aspect of a ghost dance that was possibly happening um that the kiowa tribe was doing in one of their camps and that that was one of the reasons why these three boys escaped there's there's really nothing in terms of information on why they escaped you know really nothing much about the boys themselves um and so what I wanted to do in, in thinking about this story always was creating some type of agency for for these boys and and giving them a voice because in the historical record there's literally just a paragraph written about the incident and it's written from the perspective of you know um, ethnographers or historians um, people that are non-native. And <clears throat> there's not there, the names of the headmaster and, and the people that were part of the school are in there, but but there isn't much on on the boys themselves. And so we set out to make this short film to really focus on the escape from the school. We didn't have enough time, obviously, to go through this whole epic story of their journey back home. It has a tragic ending, uh, unfortunately. They ran away in January in Oklahoma, and, and Oklahoma weather can be pretty warm in January sometimes, and it can be deceiving. A cold front can come through, and that's what happened, and unfortunately, all three of these boys perished before they actually made it uh, to the camp. They were very close to making it there, uh, but they they died of hypothermia. Um, and uh, it's in, in that sense, it's tragic. But what we're focusing on in this short story is really the triumph of freedom of escaping a boarding school, um, which now is a topic that I think uh, America is finally like trying to reckon with, which uh, seems sad when you think about it um, in terms that we're actually, but this is America, right? In terms of dealing with, with their own uh, skeletons in the closet, so to speak. And so, I think that it's the right moment uh, for this story to happen and, and, and for it to be told. You mentioned that so little is known about these Kiowa boys. How do you artfully and intentionally tell their story when you don't actually know much about them? I think about myself <laughs> and my own experiences, you know, as a, as a Kiowa boy, um, growing up with my cousins, my brothers, um, my friends, the camaraderie that we had to have in the public school system in Carnegie, Oklahoma, um, was really, really important uh, because it, it, it wasn't a boarding school, uh, but public schools back in the 1980s, um, when I was going to elementary school, were, were pretty hard places to be, and there was a lot of corporal punishment, but I try to transfer like the, those types of feelings that type of trauma. I mean, uh, it 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 
it comes through, you know, within the story and, um, and, and the writing. The, the person, my writing partner, Austin Bunn, who's a fantastic screenwriter, you know, took a lot of these ideas and feelings and really transferred them into something that's palatable to create who the, each of these boys are. But I think I think a lot of them come from me. A lot of them come from my father, um, my grandfather, who actually escaped from a boarding school when when uh, when he was younger. So it's uh, the, all of these people in my lives. I think that that really comprise these these three boys. We only have a short time left, actually, about 30 seconds here. Um, but tell us when this film will be released and how we can watch it. So I'm, I'm in the editing process right now. We just wrapped on production uh, last week. Um, I'm hoping that by the end of the month, it will be prepared enough to go out to film festivals. And probably in January is when that whole festival run really starts. So around that time, uh, January of 2023 is probably when we'll start seeing it. Um, and then hopefully the feature will come a year after that. You know, the, the it takes time to get those things off the ground. Well, Jeff Palmer, thank you so much. Thank you. And that's a slice of our Indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. Sometimes you got to take a stand just because you know you can this program is made possible by the corporation for public broadcasting a private corporation funded by the American people.